Welcome to another episode of Southern Arizona's Nonprofits, the superheroes impacting our community. We're broadcasting live today on the Tucson Business Channel, a division of Mark Bishop Media, from the Stewart Title Corporate Offices on Broadway in Tucson, Arizona. And this episode is brought to you by SCIP, S-S-C-I-P, the Social Service Contractor Indemnity Pool, insuring nonprofits like ours for more than three decades. I'm Barbara McClure, the Executive Director of Impact of Southern Arizona, host of the show. And with me today are two people representing two different organizations, one most of you will have heard before, Helping Youth, and another you may not know of, working with people of all ages with disabilities and horses. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Randy Peterson, Director of Community Engagement at Big Brothers Big Sisters of Southern Arizona. Welcome, Randy. Hello, Barbara, and thank you for having us on the show. You bet. Thanks for joining me. And also Margot De Concini, and she is with Trot Therapeutic Riding of Tucson and the Development Director. Is that correct? That's correct. I am the Development Director of Trot. Thanks, Barbara, for having me on. You're very welcome. And today there's, you know, I was thinking horses, children, it all kind of goes together. But I thought I would start with you, Randy, because, of course, we've all heard of Big Sisters, Big Brothers Big Sisters, I think, as a, as a national organization, correct? Absolutely. We've been around uh, a little over 100 years, originally started um, by a court clerk in New York City who thought that there were too many delinquent boys coming through the court system <laughs> and that they needed to find some guys. So he just took it upon himself to walk around the neighborhood and try to find guys that wanted to spend time with with boys that were, you know, getting in trouble and, I don't know, 19, early 1900s, you know, sticking <laughs> sticks in wagon wheels. I, I'm not sure what they were doing, but sure. that's the roots. And then we've been local uh, here since 1963. Oh, wow. That's still a long time yeah, in Arizona. 50, 58 years. 58, sure. yeah. And when you say local here, do you mean in Tucson or are there other chapters in the state of Arizona? Uh, right here in Tucson for 58 oh, years. Wow. There are nice. other chapters in the state of Arizona and about 250 across the country and Canada. Wow, that's pretty exciting. And I love what this organization does. So maybe you'd like to tell everyone just basically what you do, you know, your experience working with kids or or exactly how the program is set up and how it works. Sure. So at its core, uh, what Big Brothers Big Sisters of Southern Arizona does is look to match volunteer bigs. These are adults in the community, uh, 18 and over that we refer to as big brothers, big sisters, or occasionally big couples. Uh, and we match them in one-to-one -one mentoring friendships with youth uh, initially ages 6 to 14. And once kids are in the program, they can stay until they're 21 and when they age out. But it's about having that uh, adult role model uh, and mentor, but also champion and ally and friend in their lives. Uh, so I've been with the organization for about seven months, but actually have been a big brother in the program for 30 years. That's cool. Um, so it was very uh, special to me to finally be able to join the team and uh, get paid to tell people what an amazing program it is because I've been doing it for free since, right. since the early 90s, you know. And if you had the same, well, you said that the students or the children can stay till they're 21. So if you've been a big brother for 30 years, have you had multiple? Yeah, I, I'm currently matched with a, a young man here in Tucson named Miguel. We've been together about three and a half years. He will be 15 in a few weeks. But, uh, yeah, I've had six total, uh, two when I lived in Michigan, and then four uh, in the 20 years or so that I've been here in Tucson. Gosh, that's exciting. Yeah, how, absolutely. How fun. And then do you stay in touch with the um, – it, it can sometimes, vary. Yeah. It can vary, yeah. I'm, I'm in touch with two of my former littles. Uh, mm -hmm. One's currently a, a medic in the Army. Oh, He's gosh. stationed in Hawaii right now. Lucky guy. And uh, more recently, I'm, I was with a, a young gentleman for about five years. He's currently a, a high school senior at CDO. And was just accepted into the U of A. So we're, oh, nice. we're hopeful there. And having a celebration party. Exactly. Sure. Exactly. But uh, my first little brother was actually uh, named Abe. We were matched when I was a college sophomore. He was a nine-year-old. He's now 38, engineering degree from the University of Michigan, and a, couple of, a wife and a couple of wonderful kids. Gosh, isn't that a fun story? So, yeah. What a great success story. Yeah, and we, and we get those stories at times. Um, we currently have a, a former match, um, an Air Force uh, service member from the late 60s who was matched with a young boy. He's now retired and in an assisted living facility. His former little lives here and picks him up and takes him out for fun activities now. So, Boy, that's a great turnaround, you know, that's a, that's a 50 year friendship, sure. That is. Well, and that's an interesting thought, you know, that these develop that kind of friendship. I Absolutely. think that's really special. That's fun. 
Um, and what sort of things do bigs and littles do together on their outings? Obviously, the reverse is a little bit different. The, sure. The gentleman yeah. taking out the senior. But. Well, really, because we match the, the adult volunteer and the little, the big and the little, um, based on commonalities and interest and their willingness to explore new opportunities as well, there's very little limit to what they can do uh, with their time. Uh, and it is set up on their schedule. So the big works with the parent or guardian, works with the little's family, and figures it out. So we're not saying, you know, oh, if you're a big brother or a big sister, you have to be somewhere at 10 o'clock on Saturday morning. We let them figure it out. But, you know, here in a, a community that's as culturally rich as Tucson, there's so much they can do. Sporting events, um, you know, festivals, street fairs, um, just go into cultural attractions and zoos. And, and sometimes it's just, you know, grab a basketball and shoot some hoops or, you know, pick up a tennis racket and learn to play tennis or binge watch <laughs> your favorite television show, you know, there in the comfort go. of your living room. They can do it all because it's really just about spending that quality time together. That's pretty special. I love it. And I know, Margo, you're dealing with horses and I know you have children as well that are riding, but also adults. Is that correct? Yeah, so we start at age four in our programs and have no age cap. So last year, our oldest was a veteran of 86 and was still oh. still riding with us. So. Oh, that's exciting. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe you can share with the listeners what it is that Trot does. Sure. So Therapeutic Riding of Tucson has been around since 1974. Um, we're one of the first facilities in the United States to innovate the use of um, uh, adding horses as a treatment modality for individuals affected by disabilities, whether it be special needs or physical needs, physical challenges. Um, so the individuals that we're working with currently, um, we see individuals with autism, Down syndrome, cerebral palsy. Um, we see individuals um, and help, help them with um, maybe traumatic brain injuries, um, burn victims, uh, mental health trauma. We work with individuals who um, utilize wheelchairs for mobility. Um, it's We say that we help individuals of all abilities. So we don't really see a disability. We see an ability. And we try to empower all of our participants to live life without barriers through the power of horses. That is interesting. I bet somebody who is wheelchair-bound must really enjoy getting up on a horse. It must it's, be a very different experience. 100%, yeah. So it's um, what I, how I kind of often describe it as is an individual who's, who utilizes a wheelchair most often has people talking, you know, talking one-on-one -on -one with them, but always looking down upon them and not necessarily always at their level. But when that individual then gets onto the back of a horse who stands taller than we, than an average adult would stand, it's a whole different view and perspective of the world around you. And it's empowering and gives you confidence and builds your self-esteem and tells like are the children who are anyone who's getting onto the horse it it gives them a sense of pride that they can do something that someone told them they weren't able to do at all yeah and i imagine that's especially powerful i had to be in a wheelchair for about a week and went on a vacation and it was very odd to like you're saying to be below everybody's waist essentially and in a crowded space so that everybody was really close but and people tend to avoid looking at you also. So I can imagine that that's a pretty cool thing to be so high when you're used to being lower. Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a different movement through your your environment. I mean, we have our own walk and when we're in a wheelchair, we're, you know, wheeling through. But when you're on top of the horse, you feel like you're flying. It's, I it's neat. I was uh, fortunate to, I grew up in Southern California, was fortunate to spend some time in a riding club. So I have some history with horse riding and actually could stand on my head and ride around the ring in the saddle. So it's kind of a crazy, I'm sure I can't do it at this stage of my life, but you know, when you're young, you can do all kinds of crazy things, but it is a really neat experience to be on a horse. So that's a cool thing you do. Um, I was going to ask you, so what, what are they doing on the horse? So what happens in that program? Well, so we offer uh, quite a few different programs from um, equine assisted learning, which is more of an on the ground um, program where we're working with an individual to understand and learn what the horse is telling you and how that then reflects and responds to how or how you respond to what the horse is saying. So you're learning about their um, their body language and how you're perceiving it, but it also switches to see how, you know, like they're perceiving how you're acting. Um, 
that so we have those types of programs we have um, adaptive riding programs so for individuals to be riding learning horsemanship um, and horse skills in the arena while also working on their individual goals so these goals would be um, something that they uh, is really important to them in in their home whether it be getting dressed in the morning whether it be learning to cook for themselves having social skills we're taking those everyday life activities and bringing them into the arena so um, all of the the treatment plans and the arena activities are geared towards improving the enriching the life of the individual outside of the arena um it's interesting yeah i'm trying to visualize how that works so is it just as a as a reward for doing well or is it like how do you like you're talking about being able to dress yourself or take care of that in the morning. How does that translate to something you're doing in the riding ring? Yeah, definitely. So one of the examples, so for an individual who may be working on learning the sequencing process of getting dressed in the morning, we have um, little pictures of um, your articles of clothing, your shoes, your socks, your shirt, your pants, and brushing your brushes for your hair and your teeth. And so we'll place them around the arena. And so the individual who's working on the sequencing process of that will have to use their horsemanship skills of walk uh, uh, walking and stopping at the different barrels or different placements where these cards are placed and so they have to go find and put them in an order of what goes first so like they're going to stop at the barrel that has the socks on it before they stop at the barrel that has the shoes on it because you're learning that your socks go on before your shoes sure so that's an example of one of the activities that um, we would use to help an individual learn how to get dressed in the morning what comes first sure and that's interesting and that would be much more productive I'm sure than the mother trying to figure that out or the father at home you know trying to figure out how to well when you're on the back of a horse a lot of the times our participants are so um enamored in and just being on the horse that they don't really understand they don't really know that they're working on all of these things but because it's fun and it's engaging but they're really learning skills that are going to help them in their everyday life. That's really fun. I can't imagine the person who came up with that plan. So how did TROT start? Um, So back in the 70s, um, therapeutic writing in general um, started in in Europe. And so our uh, founders, Barbara Rector and Nancy McGibbon, um, uh, began utilizing horses. So uh, Nancy McGibbon is a physical therapist um, and they came together uh, to support her clients living with cerebral palsy and utilizing the horse's movement as a treatment modality. So there's a lot of research that goes into um, the movement of the horse and the gait of the horse and how it translates into our body and how our body responds to it. And so they took that information and ran with it basically so um, starting with the children with spastic cerebral palsy and then working their way up into different um, uh, research fields of other disabilities and how horses can help so the research behind it is when you're sitting on top of the horse and the horse is walking though we ourselves are not walking our brain is still telling us that we're walking because the movement of the horse is triggering proprioceptive receptors in our spine, sh- telling us where we are within our environment, which also helps to increase our blood circulation. It also helps to um, reestablish neurotransmitters from our brains to our muscles. So if you've ever been on a horse and you get off and you're like, oh, I didn't know I had those <laughs> muscles, you know, your sure. your body is still working those muscles, even though you are sitting on top of the horse. So we're we're working when an individual's on the top of the horse we're working on our core strength we're working on our back we're working on our obliques we're working on posture on our leg on our leg um strength where there's a whole, a whole bunch of like physical benefits that go along with it and so by utilizing the movement of the horse it helps for maybe an individual has trouble walking it's reestablishing the connection between our brain and our muscles to eventually have that person learn to walk again Gosh, that's amazing that can do that. Randy, have you ever been on a horse? It has been probably 40 years. <laughs> but uh, to go back to your original question uh, a little bit ago, that's one of the things my little brother wants to do now. Oh, and very so we're, cool. And so we're looking at some of the ranches around town that offer trail rides and things. That's a neat idea. And you're in the right place to be doing that, aren't Absolutely. you, in Tucson? That's terrific. What are, you know, you were talking about some of the other activities that... Um, 
big brothers do or big sis, bigs and littles. I love mm-hmm. that term. So if I were to get matched with someone, then is it you were saying, you know, we're just going to between the two of us figure out what we'd like to do together. Is that right? Yes. And then does the volunteer fund it all themselves or does Biggs help? Uh, well, actually, b- both. Uh, okay. the, the expectation is that the family is going to be able to provide the littles. Um, okay. cost for outings. Mm-hmm. But we do work with a lot of community partners here in town. So we're able to provide uh, concert tickets and sports tickets and and attraction tickets, things like that. If not completely free for the matches, then oftentimes uh, a buy one, get one. So maybe the big is paying, but the kid gets in free. Oh, that's a nice way yeah. to do it. Sure. Absolutely. <laughs> it's just such a fun thing. And I I know there are lots of other groups that try to match kids and adults, but I think Big Brothers Big Sisters has such a great reputation. Yes, yes. Here and and around the country, so that's an exciting thing. Um, I was going to ask you something else about what is it that Big Brothers Big Sisters needs most right now? And you know, we've all come through these crazy times. And and where have you, as an organization, landed? Sure, it's been an interesting two years. I believe every nonprofit in Tucson is probably going to be able to make that claim. Sure. Um, and right now, what we really need, obviously, as a nonprofit, we always need resources. But uh, perhaps more so than the financial resources is we simply need more men and women willing to stand up in our community and say, I want to be in a mentoring relationship. I, I understand the value to the kid, but making that commitment, uh, which is a, a word we're not supposed to use because it scares away sure. the guys, right? <laughs> so I'm, I'm trying to find that other word that I can use that isn't the word commitment. But basically, we're as we're looking to make a match and we're looking to recruit volunteers, we're looking for men and women that are willing to make an 18-month commitment. Because even though we work extensively to find the right little for each big, nobody has a, a lasting lifelong friendship right out of the box, right? Sure. Think about when we were first graders, you know, you might have saw that strange looking kid and thought, I'll sit with him at lunch and maybe you become best friends, but it doesn't happen overnight. So we spend a lot of time trying to make the right matches. So we do ask for that 18 month commitment. I'm happy to share that on average, our matches are together a little over three years. So that's a lot of 18 months. That's a lot of three years. That's a lot though that go on for five or six or seven years uh, at a time. And it really makes an impact on the kids. So always uh, adult volunteers is what we're looking for. And then we're always looking for people to help spread the word as well. Um, while we are a national program that has a, a fairly strong reputation, there's still a lot of confusion as to what Big Brothers Big Sisters is about. So we need those advocates out in the community that can refer families and kids that will benefit from the program. Or maybe someone that says, you know, I can't make that time commitment as a big, but, you know, my neighbor would be perfect or my coworker would be great at this. Um, You know, we take volunteers 18 and over. There's no ideal age for a big. Okay. um, And there's no ideal background. You don't have to be a a therapist or a psychologist or school teacher or anything like that. Everybody that's ever spent any amount of time with a kid can be a mentor and be a friend and be an ally. Sure. But we need more. We always need more. You know, I think a lot of nonprofits struggled during COVID with the um, reduction of volunteers. We have a lot of senior volunteers in our clientele. And of course, when COVID came and everybody was self-isolating, kind of shutting down, it, you know, we lost a lot of volunteers. So we had to kind of regroup how we staffed. So did you have that same issue with Big Brothers, Big Sisters? A- absolutely. There's always a natural attrition in our program as kids are aging out or families moving away or a, a big moving away, things like that. Um, and that was all uh, accelerated by COVID, of course, over the last couple of years. Sure. So we lost a lot more of the matches that we had made. We worked mightily to keep everyone we could. Um, but also on the flip side, we're normally matching <laughs> you know, eight or 10 or 12 new kids each month into the program. And unfortunately, because of COVID for about 15 months, we only matched about 15 kids total. Oh, wow. Um, So it really slowed down the growth of our program, uh, brought us down from a a census of helping about 600 kids a year to about 350. Mm -hmm. And now we've started in the last six months or so to kind of come back from that. And our uh, recently passed strategic plan has us getting back to about 600 in about two years. Well, now. that's not bad at all. But again, that's going to rely on those folks in the community standing up as well. I can go out and tell them how much fun I have as a big, and it really is fun. 
and I can tell them about the impact it has on the kids. I can tell them how the impact it's had on me as a person. Um, but we still need the people that'll say, yes, I want to learn more. Sure. So once we get them in the door, then we can keep them. Oh, yeah, we know yeah. that at Impact, too. That's <laughs> very true, isn't it? And I think you're, and for you, you know, having a personal story and having had these mm. relationships, that's always so powerful, I think. Absolutely. When you hear that, you know, directly from somebody who has been affected. Absolutely, yeah. I, I can speak to, to what it's meant for the littles that I've uh, been honored to work with, but also what it has meant for me as a person. I do things now that I don't think I would do if my little said, didn't, wasn't there to say, Randy, can we try this? Uh-huh. <laughs> you know, we've, we've been going to concerts that I wouldn't probably have chosen. We've, sure. you know, uh, I'm not the world's biggest soccer fan, but we became fans of FC Tucson and started going to the games um, and just having all sorts of fun. And, and he takes me shopping now in South Tucson. Um, it's just all sorts of wonderful stuff. And it's helped both of us. Yeah, you know, I never really looked at it that way because we tend to be thinking about the kids who need the support. But I love mm -hmm. that story because that is a great way to change your own life as a volunteer. Absolutely. That's pretty cool. I, I would be home sitting on the couch if it go. wasn't for, for Big Brothers Big Sisters. <laughs> <laughs> and that's easy to do, isn't it? Yes. We were having that conversation earlier about Thanksgiving and who had a really fun casual Thanksgiving and versus the responsibilities of having gatherings and families, mm -hmm. which is fun, but it, after COVID especially, it's kind of a challenge. So I'm curious, where do the littles come from? So the littles um, are from all around Tucson. We don't work in any specific geography or school district or okay. anything like that. Um, so we have really littles throughout the entire greater Tucson area, if you will. So we like to say from Vail up to Marana and Oro Valley. Um, but a lot of them are right from, you know, the core uh areas of, of Tucson here, because that's where our volunteers come from. And one of the things we've learned over the years is because the adult is going to meet the child, pick them up, do an outing, and take them back home, it's best if we can work with uh, situations where the drive is, you know, 15 or 20 minutes as opposed to 30 or 40 minutes. Um, so a lot of kids uh, throughout the entire district, and then they're going through the process much like the adults do. So they learn about the program, but we interview them. We tell them about the program. We have orientations for them and the parent and guardian um, so that they can feel comfortable with the program. Because we say, you know, in general, oh, you know, don't don't go out with strangers. Right. And then suddenly the in the little's life, we say, well, look, here's this stranger. Go go miniature golfing with them. Here's you know? this nice man. Have, go exactly. have fun with him. So, yeah. so we want to make sure the kids are always <laughs> very point. comfortable uh, with the program as well. So we we do rely a lot on uh, educators and social workers and other nonprofits to refer kids that we can work with. Um, but we're also out there in the community just attending, you know, street fairs and festivals and all sorts of community events just to get the word out, both to attract those volunteer adults, but also to recruit parents, guardians, and the kids. Oh, that's nice. I wasn't sure if your children, as you were talking about in the beginning, you know, the beginning of the organization where you've got a court judge right, saying I've right. got some kids that need some help. So it's not necessarily that you're going to get matched with somebody who's has a lot of behavior issues or struggling exactly. or, um, a, or a criminal record that you're going to be Yeah, we, we talk supporting. a lot about uh, defending the potential of these kids. So we don't think of them sure. or, or talk about them as at risk or at need. Uh, we like to think of them as these vats of potential that we just need that adult volunteer to help fill. Um, so while it is true that uh, about 70% of the kids are in single parent households, that's not always the case. Um, they do tend to come from um, you know, about 60% are from uh, poverty line or below here in our community, but that's that's kind of Tucson in general, right? Sure. And, you know, they're, they're coming from a variety of backgrounds and situations. In, in my case, with my little brother, um, he's one of five kids in the household, and mom's really busy. Right? I can so, imagine. <laughs> so he needs, that, he needs that adult role model just to help him get out of the house, you know, once in a while. So and we do tend to enroll a lot of siblings, um, so oh, when sure. one gets into the program and, and the family learns what it's about, we tend to get a lot of brothers and sisters over the, over time. And really the, the great source of referrals is the kids themselves. You know, they talk, they text. Um, when one of them's out yeah. with a big and, and starts having fun, you know, they'll tell a friend. Um, and we learn more about the program that way as well. So That's a neat idea. Yeah. You know, that's a... I can see how that would work very easily. It's also how we tend to get a lot of our big brothers and big sisters as well. One starts the program, and then they tell their friends and coworkers, or just come in on the office on Monday and say, oh, you know, I had the best time with my little. Um, that's a great way to grow the program as well. Sure. 
that's a it's a good thing for people to be thinking about. And I yes. love your story about where you get to go out and try new things as a volunteer. So that's uh, I imagine it would be hard. I was picturing when you said from a family of five or five children mm -hmm. that. So you know that one child gets to go off and have this amazing adventure with the big, and then everybody yes. else is sitting at home and come back and say, "Oh gosh, you know." Yeah. I want to do that yeah. too. So well, we're we're fortunate. Miguel's youngest sister just our younger sister just got matched in the program a couple oh, of weeks nice. ago, and she's started to go out and have adventures now too. So that's exciting. Well, we'll uh, we'll learn more about that as we find out more about Big Brothers Big Sisters, and I think it'd be fun to. Uh, we've got some children up in Catalina who probably could benefit from that program. Absolutely, we'd love to come up and meet them. Sure, and we've also adopted a lot of single. Mothers. We have a whole group of single mothers that we support, so that would be a good place too. Well, we're going to take a quick break to hear from Skip and hear what they can do for nonprofits like ours. Today's program is brought to you by Skip, the Social Service Contractors Indemnity Pool. Skip is a member owned, member directed insurance provider with more than three decades of insuring Arizona social service organizations for their property, general and professional liability, and auto claim exposures. With an Arizona-based staff of claim underwriting and risk management professionals, Skip specializes in providing personalized service, affordable premiums, and coverage which meets and often exceeds the state of Arizona's contract requirements for social service providers. For more information, visit our website at www.sscip.org or ask your insurance agent about protecting your organization with insurance coverage through SKIP. Well, welcome back. I'm Barbara McClure, and I'm here with Margo and Randy, and we're talking about TROT and Big Brothers Big Sisters. And Margo, I was wondering if you could tell us um, what sets TROT apart from other organizations? Well, TROT, so TROT has been around since 1974, so we're on our will be our 48th year come February 22nd um, uh, here serving the Tucson community. But what really sets us apart is our accreditation. We are a premier accredited center by the Professional Association of Therapeutic Horsemanship. And with that, our accreditation holds us to about 300 plus research and education or um, evidence-based programs and um, that we have to implement within our programs to be up to par with the rest of the research in the field of therapeutic writing. Um, and so with that, like we are also a research center as well. So the U of A has come out and done um, a lot of research for um, the equine science community, as well as other types of um, physical and occupational and speech traditional counseling services as well have come out. So um, we're really um, a hub to show and benefit, show what the benefits are of utilizing or partnering with a horse within a treatment for healing. I love the idea that the that you're a resource for the U of A too. I mean, that's such a great opportunity. What a gem to have in the community. So that's a, a cool thing. Um, I was you were talking earlier about the medical research, and then, and so I can see why the partnership with the U of A is so important and what attracts them to you. And I know I've been to the facility, and it's not really central, is it? No. Maybe you no. can tell people where it where it's located, because I remember the first time I went there, I thought, wow, it's really far out here. But I live up in the northern area, like by Catalina at the top of the county. Oh, you're on the so, west side. So it was a yeah. trek. Yeah, so we're on Tanca Verde and Catalina Highway. We're almost on the way up to Mount Lemmon mm -hmm. um, on this little street called Woodland. And if you've never been out to Woodland Road, I would highly encourage it. It's a, a one-mile stretch of road that transports you out of Tucson. There's grass and horses and sheep and a longhorn steer and miniature horses <laughs> and and everything. So it's like you you're not in Tucson anymore, Dorothy. Right. <laughs> like, it sounds like it. And those aren't all on your property. No, no, those no. Those are on the neighboring yeah, property. On the whole street. Yeah. But um the special piece that I like to say is a special piece of Woodland is trot. And a lot of our volunteers and participants will say that as they turn on to Woodland and they're driving in, they're, you know, coming into Trot, it feels like they're coming home. And so our, we have 18 acres out um, on Woodland and there's a space for everyone. There's a serene spot for parents to 
take a breath and breathe and watch their child succeed. There's a place for veterans and first responders to find solace and refill their cup. There's there's a place for everyone, even our volunteers. So, Randy, you were talking about how being, you know, volunteering in your programs that was really beneficial for you on a personal level. Our volunteers find the same. So not only are you helping an individual improve and enrich their lives and go on to do bigger and better things, but you're also interacting with animals, which is a fun thing for all of us. Sure. Um, but you're doing a good thing and you're the community that you create at Tra or for that most of our volunteers have experienced at Tra is you become family with everybody and it's um, a wonderful feeling to to have out on our property. So and we get a lot of volunteers who may have had um, a uh, horses in their past and have had to get rid of them or not be around them. So it's kind of like one of those surrogate pieces uh, sure. where they can come out and kind of be the the horse parent for, uh, you know, an hour or two to get their fix and then um, and, and get to work with wonderful people and do wonderful things. Now, where do you get your volunteers from? Because, again, you're like, Randy's got an advantage because he's in all the corners of the community, so it's easy to find somebody maybe nearby. But you're trying to attract volunteers to a far corner location. So I'm wondering where you get a lot of your volunteers and do you have to have horse experience? Well, so for all of our volunteers, you don't have to have horse experience. All of our volunteers are trained and certified through our accrediting process. Um, so we'll teach you everything. There's different levels to being a volunteer from starting as a sidewalker or being, um, you know, helping with a uh, I guess top level would be at the barn. That's like the one place that everyone wants to be. I'll, <laughs> sure. I'll shovel the, the manure. Um, but uh, so there's different levels and we'll train you and work with you to be part of the volunteer group that you then get into. But um, we find our volunteers everywhere. So we have volunteers that come from Catalina. We have volunteers who come from Green Valley, Sorita area. We have it, everywhere, really, That's honestly. That's fantastic. It is nice because that is a trick. But I know in Catalina, we have a lot of horse properties. So I can see where people who maybe have done their horses in their life and now they may not have them anymore. That would be a great opportunity. Mm -hmm. So a lot of retired folk volunteering for a little um, bit of everybody. It's it's a little bit of everybody. Yeah, I think within the last um, since COVID, we've really increased our younger crowd. We're um, appealing to uh, a lot of the college kids. We're appealing to, um, and even with the U of A having their equine and their behavioral health, uh, equine behavior health center over at Almara on Bear Canyon, we get a lot of those students over on our property as well. So a lot of college kids, we get. Um, a lot of high schoolers as well that are coming out and doing their volunteer hours with us and really just never seem to leave, which we love. Um, we love all of our volunteers, but we do have a lot of snowbirds. We have a lot of retired school teachers and social workers. We have a lot of um, just a, a wide mixture of such cool people. You know, that's one really cool thing about Tucson. We have so many nonprofits in Tucson, but we really do have a great group of volunteers. And I think yes. being a retirement community, we are fortunate to have this pool of people who, well, I say who have time. You know, you hear people who retire say, I don't know how I ever did it when I was working because I have so much, I'm so busy. But I think it's nice to be able to choose what you want to do. <clears throat> yeah. Me. And we we have something for everyone, whether it be in the office or out in the at the barn or um, just, I mean, just hanging out, volunteering to hang out. We, we we want you on our property. We want you to be part of our family. Sure. So how do you fund your programs at Trot? And where do your horses come from? So we fund our programs um, in a lot of different ways. Um, we utilize foundations and grants in the community. We um, are have different affiliations through um, national uh, equine associations throughout uh, the United States. Um, but the majority of it come from the community. So the community helps to fund our scholarship program that we have. Um, the community helps to support our, our property projects that we're working on. Um, we have a lot of really great supporters in the community that 
get us to where we're going. Um, one of our um, one of our biggest supporters is the Donegan Burns Foundation here in Tucson, and they support therapeutic writing for PATH centers, which is what we are. Um, but they have done a lot to help support the foundation of our fundraising efforts. So helping put in for like our events that we do, helping with our marketing management, helping with a whole bunch of other stuff. But um, we have we do also get a lot of revenue from our events that we put on, um, which we have about three a year. Year. Um, we're bringing back our golf tournament this Boy, summer. That's going to so. keep you busy. Three fun, three big fundraising events a year. Oh yeah, but it's so much fun. I know we've fun. all three done fundraising, so we're all going. Oh my gosh, yes. yeah, it's daunting. I absolutely love it, but we've got a great team that is behind us and and helps put on all of that for us. So you have a golf tournament, so people who want to golf to make some money for you. And yep. what other kinds of fundraisers do you do? So we events? have, yeah, so we have an annual gala that we do um, uh, every fall. Um, ours this last year was in September, September 11th. It was called Heroes, Hearts and Horses. Um, and it's our premier event. Um, so we have that in the fall. In the springtime, we have a um, a backyard barbecue kind of hoedown thing called Horsin' Around. Oh, um, and that that's coming up um, on March 26th. And it's going to be um, on Trot's property for the first time. Um, oh, nice. Yeah, we're really excited for it. Um, and then the golf tournament will be in May, uh, May 14th at the Arizona National. Very nice. So lots of ways to get involved. Tons. I love the idea of having a, a you know a hoe down in the backyard, and I think it's so funny because with the horses you can really have some fun plays on words. Oh, definitely, <laughs> that is fun. <laughs> How about you, Randy? How do you support Bigs? How do you fund Bigs well, as an organization? It, yeah, it's a it's a lot of the same formula. We do um, three major events as well. For us, it's our uh, gala, which we have every fall as well. We just had uh, the big luau. Uh, oh, at the beginning of October, and I believe this coming October, we're going to have a Western theme for it. We're still negotiating among <laughs> various parties on that theme. Um, we also do a lot extensively with um, folks that want to ride for us in El Tour to Tucson. So we just had about 50 individuals uh, riding for us a couple of weeks ago there. And wow. then we also do what we call a bowl and play for kids' sake. So bowl for kids' sake uh, has been done nationally by Big Brothers Big Sisters for many decades. Um, here locally, we still do that, but we've also grown it to uh, bocce ball and cornhole uh, oh. tournaments as well. So we do that over several different weekends in the spring um, and a chance for a lot of our uh, corporate partners and friends to come out with teams and raise money. So that's the special events aspect. We do, of course, rely on uh, individual donors and a lot of uh, corporate support and foundations. Um, we're the recipient of a matching challenge right now from the Connie Hillman Family Foundation, uh, which is helping to match new donors. So we're trying to grow the family. And then we, uh, because of the work we do uh, and the evidence-based um, progress that we can see in the kids, we do receive a lot of grants from the Department of Justice. So sure. specifically for things like working with kids who have incarcerated parents or who have had uh, opiate uh, addictions in their family or who have experienced trauma uh, in their lives. We do a lot of uh, administration of Justice Department grants that way as well. That's an interesting way, an interesting partnership mm -hmm. to bring in. Yes, yes. Always <laughs> always fun to work with the federal government, but they've been <laughs> great partners with us for a long time. Uh, and and they can see the progress in the kids as well um, as we're working, working with them on a lot of issues. Sure. That's a pretty cool thing. Well, it sounds like you're both going to be very busy all year long. Yes. Definitely. <laughs> but what neat projects to bring people together to, you know, to have a party, so to speak, and to bring kids together. I was thinking about bowling and thinking, do we have bowling alleys in Tucson still? We do. We yeah, do. Absolutely. Okay. I, you know what? We live out where there are no bowling alleys. <laughs> and when I drive, I think the one Bedrocks I was nearby the other day and they look like they weren't up anymore. Yeah. Bedrocks went away a couple of years ago, unfortunately. Sure. I think this past year we were out at Lucky Strike and I can't recall the name of the one on West River Road, right at River and Oracle, but sure. we were there as well. And we always, and of course, with bocce ball and cornhole, we can always bring that barber right to your backyard if you want. I just can ask you where you play bocce ball. Uh, we played in Reed Park this past oh, summer, sure. and it also gave us a chance to to be a little bit more sensitive to the COVID situation for folks who were willing, maybe not willing to join us in a bowling alley, but were willing to mask up and join us outdoors. So, but we had so much fun. We we're going to continue to do it, pandemic or not. There you go, and the weather's perfect in Tucson Absolutely. for something like that. So and you can do it even in the 
in the cooler climates <laughs> or the <laughs> maybe not the warm of summer. Um, so you you guys were talking about your upcoming events, and I imagine you're both qualified for the charitable contribution. Absolutely. Is that true, the tax mm-hmm. credit contribution? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's important for people to know because we're coming up on year end. And of course, you can give your tax credit through April, but it is good to know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We love to just convince them to do it by December 31st to take care of the feds and the state and all of it in one shot. Right? Get it all done at once. <laughs> you know, I, I always think it's fun, though, in when you get your donations in in March and you'll find, you know, somebody wants to donate three hundred ninety seven dollars and twelve cents. And you yes. think they've just come from their <laughs> accountant. So but it's all money well spent, whichever organization our listeners fund. So we're Absolutely. glad you both qualify for that because that's a great opportunity. Um, I'm trying to think, Margo, do you have any other fun things you want to share about your organization that you want people to know? Um, so we were talking about programs a little bit earlier, and um, it I didn't mean to skip over it, but um, we have a... Um, a program called Heroes on Horses, which is specific for um, our uh, veterans and our first responders in the community. Um, And so this program um, is facilitated by our mental health professional, but there's a lot of different programs that go into it. Um, So we first started it in 2006 with a partnership with the VA, um, working with their their poly trauma unit um, and working with individuals who um, had spinal cord injury, traumatic brain injury, depression, anxiety, PTSD, and those types of things. And so um, working with the veterans and, and and first responders in our community is really rewarding. But one of the really wonderful things that our community allows us to do is provide this program to each one of them and their families for free. So 100% free for those individuals to come out and participate with us. Um, And right now we have um, one of the programs is a Calvary program. And so um, one of our volunteers is... um, Uh, rode in the cavalry in the army and is teaching our current veterans how to ride cavalry um, positions and um, in the arena. So doing different uh, um, activities, like it's kind of like a synchronized riding routine. Um, It's really neat to see. That's fun. Yeah. So (laughs) what a great way to engage somebody who's already a veteran in something that's so unique. Right. Yeah, definitely. So um, they're working on their Calvary uh, routine. And then we have others who are working on um, whatever they're working on in in their life, whatever their goals are that they've created um, with the help of the uh, our mental health professional to uh, to address things that are you know challenging them at that time. So they get partnered with a horse. And basically, it's the the person and the horse create this um, uh, pull to each other that creates the partnership. So our mental health professional will walk them down the aisle and talk and through our barn and kind of introduce them to all of the horses. And the horse is usually one that will pick on you, like will pick sure. you as their person. And so that's where our um, our facilitator will create and really facilitate that connection between that person and that horse. So horses have this really big electromagnetic field around them that pull and draw on different energy. Um, And if, you know, whatever their piece is missing, the horse will fill. So um, that's where the draw comes from. And um, being able to have those individuals partner together um, is to create one person is really neat to watch in the arena, um, whether they're working one-on-one or working in groups. Um, so that's our Heroes on Horses program. But we also have um, a program for dedicated for teens or specifically designed for teens um, who may be struggling after COVID or even pre-COVID um, with, called uh, Creating Connection from the Ground Up. And so it's working on um, those who may have um, social anxiety, depression, anxiety, depression and anxiety. We're working with individuals who have um, maybe some substance use. We're working with individuals with body dysmorphia, just any type of... Of challenge that they're experiencing, we are working with them and the horses partnering them to create a connection and really be able to grow from the program that we have with them, that we're working with them. Yeah, those are some pretty special impacts on those riders. Oh, yeah, um, it, it really is. You know, I mean, COVID has been a really tough time for all mm-hmm. teens in general. Um, but 
when you haven't really been able to meet or make a new friend, having a horse as your new friend or your best friend right. is really powerful um, and inspiring and it gives them confidence and it gives them a little bit of peace even for just that moment that allows them to continue on as long as, you know, just to continue on. Sure. So um, it's really, it's fun to see right now we're working, we have a group of girls that come out and it's really, um, it's really nice to see the transformation that they've made from the first group session that they had to where they are now towards the end of the semester. Yeah, it's pretty fun. I imagine to a horse, you know, like we know about dogs, I was going to say and cats, but I'm not sure if this is so true of cats. You know, a dog is your best friend and there's just that connection and they love you and they're with you. And, and I'm, I know from my own riding, that's a special thing with horses as well. So it's that complete acceptance. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, the no judgment zone. Exactly. You know? Like they're not going to judge you. They're not going to do anything but help you. Um, one thing that's really, really amazing about horses is that um, in on a one-on-one -on -one basis with them, they act as a mirror or provide immediate feedback to you. So if you're work, uh, partnered with your horse and you're feeling like you have a lot of uh, anxiety at that time, your horse is going to show you that they themselves are also feeling anxious by um, not wanting to come near you or being, you know, just want, needing their space or feeling, you can tell that they're feeling really anxious. They're not relaxed. And so this allows for us to work on ourselves, reflect on ourselves and how we're feeling and how others are perceiving us, but then create coping skills to help reduce our anxiety to to bring our energy down and you'll immediately see it on the horse as well. Um, one of our horses actually is super sensitive to energies. Um, and this is my favorite thing to watch and talk about, but, um, you're in a, in a round arena with him and you have, you, you work to bring your energy up really, really, really high. And he starts cantering around you. And then you start working to bring your energy down or calming your energy and being, you know, calmer and he starts trotting and you bring yourself even further down and you're more calm and you're more relaxed in your body and he starts walking. But then the moment that you start bringing your energy up, even just in the middle of the, of the round pen, he starts trotting and going and cantering again, based just on your energy and your breath. That's how sensitive he, he specifically is, but horses in general are very sensitive to our energies and how we feel and how we react within our environment. That's an interesting story. I've not, you know, I haven't had that experience myself, so that is cool. How many horses do you have in the stable? Four, we have 14 at, at this time. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we, um, we get horses, um, most of the horses that we have, we've purchased ourselves. We're very particular about our horses. And one of the biggest misconceptions about our program is that we're a horse rescue, and we are not. Our horses are professionally trained and certified to do the things that we do, um, even to the point where um, we consider them close to like a seeing eye dog or a service animal. Sure. Um, a couple of our horses are even trained to detect seizures in individuals. And so um, they wow. have their own working schedule. They have an exercise schedule. They have their own dietitian. They, they are very, very well cared for. Um, and we're very particular about the horses that we bring on because we want to make sure that one, as a business decision, they're going to be sustainable in the long the long term for our program but also to really be able to see that they can continue to touch and change the lives of the individuals that we're working with so sure. i can see that they're very specialized they, yeah. they are very <laughs> special yeah so we do accept donations of horses um but uh it's We'll work with individuals on the horses that are looking to be donated, but the majority of them we end up purchasing. Sure. That's good to know. Randy, I've got a question for you, too, about your kids, because I was thinking, you know, I, I often wonder if there are children, you know, if, if there are ways for the guests to partner and if you have an opportunity to to um, have your children, your littles participate with their bigs in a program like that. So I imagine you're also working with children with disabilities and without disabilities. Yeah, absolutely. We're always looking for collaborations. At our core, we are a one-to-one -one mentoring program, but we do uh, we do have some site-based programs. So we work in some of the schools on uh, 
uh, programs that are existent within the schools themselves. So exam uh, for example, this week, I had the privilege to uh, accompany some of my coworkers to take a bunch of Prince Elementary kids to Flandreau Science Center and Planetarium on campus. So that was a, a partnership that we do with uh, the folks at Comcast NBC Universal, for example. Um, and yeah, we're always looking for unique opportunities um, for you know, maybe the matches can come out, to, you know, three or four matches at a time, you know, so there's eight or 10 people or something and do cooking classes or, you know, crafting or things like that. So we're always uh, working with those opportunities. We've worked in the past with uh, Texas Instruments and IBM to come in and do some STEM education sorts of workshops and things like that. So, yeah, we'll, we'll work with anybody that wants to work with helping kids. Well, let me ask you this question because I know – what is one of the biggest misconceptions about bigs? Um, I, well, I'll, I'll say that there's two. Okay. Uh, one misconception is that the kids are somehow damaged or in trouble or at risk or, you know, troublemakers, right? And I talked about a little bit about how the organization started, obviously. But these really are just kids that need to have that potential within them, defended and sparked. So they're looking for that role model, that ally, that friend. The other misconception really about the program is, and, we, and I hear this a lot from potential bigs as I'm out in the community, well, you know, it's, it's two to three hours a week, uh, you know, two or three times a month or two or three times an outing, I should say, you know, I don't have the time. Well, sure. the average adult in America spends two and a half hours on social media every day. <laughs> so I'm just asking for one day back every other weekend where you can go out and, and go to a football game or go to the park or go, you know, horseback riding or, you know, just shoot hoops in the park with a kid or take him out for ice cream, something like that, right? Go That's to the right. movies. So just put that phone down. You do have the time. I and think that's a fair yes, comment. Yes. yes. I think we all have time. It's just how we organize it, how we spend it. So, Absolutely. And then, you know, we always get a lot more boys into the program. So we're always looking for a lot more men. Okay. Um, the adult volunteers, the big sisters, tend to find us. Uh, so we always have a, a, a fair number of them. And as we talk about the men sometimes struggling to make that commitment for 18 months, once we get a guy, they actually, on average, stay in the program much longer than the women do. Oh, interesting. So if I can, if I can get over that hurdle, if I can convince a guy how much fun he's going to have and start the program, then, then he's a lifer like I am. There you go. Yep. Well, it's recruiting, isn't it? Yes. That's a challenge. Well, gosh, I appreciate both of you being here so much. And I think if you have anything else you want to add, we're probably going to wrap it up here pretty quick. Do you have anything else, Randy, that you wanted to... Make sure we all know before we. All right. Well, almost everything here. in our organization starts with a visit to our website. There you That's go. That's where you apply to be a big, where you apply to have your, you know, child in the program, and where you learn about more of what we do. And that's soazbigs.org. Thank you. And we, for our listeners, we post all of the contact information, so all of you who are listening can reach out and connect with either of these organizations or both of them, and learn more or volunteer, donate, be part of this big community. Well, thank you both for coming today. I appreciate your time. And listeners, thank you for your time.